Greetings, Sun Devil Nation, and welcome to this week's installment of the Anderson Healy Show. This is the Mountain America Credit Union Sun Devil Radio Network broadcast that brings you up to speed every week on all the latest developments in Arizona State University Sun Devil Athletics. Hi, everybody. I'm Tim Healy, the radio play-by-play -play voice of ASU football, men's basketball, and baseball, and it is my pleasure to serve as your co-host every week. My co-host, as always, Arizona State Vice President for University Athletics, Ray Anderson. Ray, good to see you. Always a pleasure, Tim. Good to see you, and got a lot to talk about. We sure do. It seems like every week we do, and as the season, as the fall goes <laughs> on, more and more things to talk about. Arizona State's 21st ranked women's volleyball program will be the focal point of today's show as the Sun Devils are coming off of a home split of their two Pac-12 matches at Utah and at Colorado. First-year assistant coach Presley Anderson, who is a Valley native and the daughter of a former Sun Devil student-athlete, will be one of our guests today as she will uh, tell us about her journey back home to coach at ASU and about her 2023 Sun Devil volleyball team. In addition, today you will meet a special young lady, Sun Devil middle blocker Maddie McLaughlin, whose personal journey back from significant health issues has been an inspirational story for her and her coaches and teammates as they progress through the 2023 season. So Maddie McLaughlin and Presley Anderson will be joining us from Sun Devil Volleyball later in this week's show. We begin this week with a look back at a compelling evening of Pac-12 football last Saturday night in the uh, Emerald City of Seattle, Washington for Coach Kenny Dillingham's Arizona State Sun Devils. Entering last Saturday's game with unbeaten and fifth-ranked Washington as a four-touchdown underdog. The Sun Devils came oh so close to pulling off what would have been one of college football's biggest upsets in this century. However, despite a brilliant performance from the ASU defense, the Devils' upset bid fell short in a 15-7 defeat with a Washington pick six midway through the fourth quarter, Ray, the basic difference in the ballgame. It sure was, Tim, and I don't think it's an exaggeration to say it would have been one of the biggest upsets this century in college football. Uh, they came in at number five with a lot of uh, hype. Uh, we mm -hmm. came in uh, struggling but still with confidence, and we played them uh, very tough. And defensively, uh, I don't think there's any question, it's one of the finest defensive performances and coordinating jobs you will see uh, this season or probably any other. So, uh, But we fell short, uh, unfortunately, but boy, uh, did it give you a preview of how good this team can be, certainly on defense. We'll give you some of the numbers. Brian Ward's fantastic defense put together on Saturday in a moment. But, Ray, I, you're talking about the biggest upsets ever. I referenced on the air on Saturday. I think it would have been the biggest since your alma mater, Stanford, in, in 2007, I believe, went to the Coliseum coming off of a 40-3 to loss to Dennis Erickson Sun Devils <laughs> as a 43-point underdog against uh, top uh, first place mm -hmm. USC. And uh, lo and behold, the Stanford Cardinal got him at the Coliseum on that night. And Jim Harbaugh's first year as their head coach. Yeah, well, I'm telling you, that's why they say you still got to go play the game. You can't just roll your helmet out there uh, as the favorite thinking it's all going to roll your way. So we're a 28-point uh, underdog in this game. Uh, and look what happened. We almost, almost knocked them out. So uh, that's the great thing about college football. Uh, no matter what the so-called spread might be, you got to go out there and play because the right. other guys who are on the other end of that spread, they're not always buying it, Tim. Yeah. They're coming to play. Well, that's what the great Chris Berman always said on ESPN. Yeah. That's why they play the games. <laughs> and the Sun Devils defense played themselves a game on Saturday. How about these jaw-dropping numbers turned in by coordinator Brian Ward's ASU defense? A Washington offense that was third nationally coming into the game in total yards, averaging 544 yards per game, only 288 yards of offense on Saturday against Arizona State. A Husky offense that was fifth in the nation in scoring, averaging over 44 points per game, scored 15 points, no offensive touchdowns allowed by Arizona State. And that ASU defense made Washington a one-dimensional football team in that game as the Sun Devils held the Huskies to a meager 13 rushing yards. Those are incredible numbers. If only Sun Devil offense could have just put up a few more points. Oh man, those were incredible numbers. And as you were there watching it, you, you knew you were seeing something special on the defensive side. Washington literally stopped trying to run the ball. 
They just went one dimensional to the passing game because that 13 yards uh, was about all they were going to get <laughs> if they kept it up. So, uh, yes, just uh, some offense, uh, and we win that game. Uh, I don't think you can uh, uh, say it any other way because defensively you could not do any more than this defense did on Saturday night, Tim. So uh, disappointing with the loss, but yeah. certainly uh, incurs and really proud of the defense. And indeed, uh, this program is growing. The record doesn't reflect it, but with the w one exception, the Fresno State game, Arizona State has been competitive in every game it's played this season. And uh, twice were oh so very close to knocking off heavily favored fifth-ranked opponents. USC, you'll recall, mm -hmm. was a five-touchdown favorite here against ASU back on September the 23rd, and the Devils were right in that game till the end, and they were ranked fifth in the country at that time. And then last week, fifth-ranked Washington in Seattle, coming off a tremendous victory over Oregon, and the Sun Devils nearly got the Huskies. And nearly got the Huskies, almost got the Trojans, and now... What we're looking to do is learn to finish, put it all together in all three parts of the game, offense, defense, and special teams. You put that together, and this team's got some real uh, potential. And the Sun Devils hope to start realizing that potential this week. What better time? It'll be homecoming weekend at Arizona mm -hmm. State as the Sun Devils take on the Washington State Cougars in a 5 p.m. kickoff at Mountain America Stadium this coming Saturday. Do we call it afternoon? Do we call it evening? Whatever it is, <laughs> we hope to be calling your name and they hope you're there at the stadium <laughs> to cheer the Devils on. Our radio coverage of the game will begin at 2.30 on Saturday afternoon with the Sun Devil Tailgate Show hosted by Jeff Munn and Kevin Turner. Jeff Van Raphorst will then join KT and me for the play-by-play -play broadcast starting at 5 p.m. You can hear all the action on ESPN 620 AM Unless, unless the Arizona Diamondbacks advance to the World Series. As we record this broadcast, we are just hours away from the start of Game 7 in Philadelphia between the Diamondbacks and the Philadelphia Phillies. And if the D-backs win that ball game, they, uh, the, our Saturday football broadcast will be carried on KTAR News 92.3 FM. If, uh, this, if the Diamondbacks don't make it to the World Series, we'll be on ESPN 620 AM this coming Saturday. In any case, the game will, our game will be streamed on ArizonaSports.com and on the Arizona Sports app. Well, the Sun Devil football program and all of Sun Devil athletics is mourning the loss of a beloved family member these days. Alex Hodge, who is Arizona State's director of football video for the last 11 years, died this past Friday evening, October 20th, at the age of 43, after battling stage four colon cancer for several months. An Illinois native and a graduate of Illinois State University, Alex Hodge joined the Sun Devil football program back in 2012, coming to ASU with then head coach Todd Graham, after Alex had worked for Coach Graham at both right at, at uh, Rice, Tulsa and the University of Pittsburgh. Alex quickly became one of the Pac-12's very best at his job. In fact, Hodge was named the Pac-12 Video Coordinator of the Year in 2018 and 19. And Ray, that certainly was a tribute to what his peers around the conference thought of Alex's work. And uh, certainly he was beloved by everybody in athletics and particularly in the Sun Devil football program. Yes, Tim, and it is sad. Uh, Alex was beloved, to be sure, and what a professional uh, at the top of his game, as you say, as a video director uh, for football. Beloved uh, is an understatement, uh, both here and around the conference with his peers. Uh, and you always uh, just shake your head and wonder uh, at 43 yeah. why you got called. But uh, he was called, and uh, as, as folks who know him, uh, I know they're wishing him nothing but the best in his family. Uh, ASU is looking, Sun Devil football, Sun Devil athletics, to uh, host a memorial for Alex at the appropriate time mm -hmm. uh, here coming up. And so uh, we'll make sure all of the Sun Devil nation that want to come uh, and, and help celebrate uh, Alex will know when that is and, and hopefully get a chance to come share uh, in his memories. But Alex Hodge, he was uh, one of the best and will be always remembered here. Uh, in this AS, ASU football program. It really hit me when I saw a, a nice tribute to Alex on uh, the Arizona State Athletics website. 
and I didn't realize he was born, I believe, in December of 1979, and that was three months after my, my firstborn, my daughter Katie, came into the world, and I just can't imagine what Alex's parents and his brother are going through right now. No, you just, uh, it's, it's hard. It's got to be, but his brothers, uh, as I understand it, were able to make it in time uh, to say their goodbyes, and his parents uh, have been, uh, been here, so... Uh, a real sad time for ASU uh, athletics, ASU football, and so we, we wish uh, nothing but the best for the Hodge family. And, Absolutely. Uh, our, 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 our deepest condolences uh, regarding Alex. And we echo those condolences on behalf of our radio network and all of Sun Devil Athletics to uh, the family of the late Alex Hodge. Let's get back to talking some ASU sports now. How about the Sun Devil hockey team off to a 4-0 and start this year, which happens to be the best start in program history after the Devils swept two games from Northern Michigan this past weekend at Mullet Arena. ASU winning by scores of 3-2 to two on Friday and 5-1 to one last Saturday with, get this, eight different players scoring the eight Arizona State goals in those two games. And with the two wins now, Ray, Coach Greg Powers' team rose in the national rankings. Arizona State this week, the number 13 ranked hockey team in the country. Uh, isn't that something? Uh, and when you say off to 4-0 and start, our best start in history, uh, folks who follow hockey, particularly college hockey, understand sweeping two series in a row, winning four games in a row, it, in this sport, that's hard. From good opponents, too. From good opponents, Mary Mark, Mack, and then Northern uh, Michigan. So uh, number 13, I believe that's our highest ranking in our, our seven or eight years. I'd have to go so. back and check, but I'm pretty sure – I don't remember uh, any higher. Yeah, That's yeah, but, but Greg Powers has got this team Man, does he ever. Uh, re really rolling. And you talk about balance when you have eight goals and eight different players uh, scoring goals <laughs> over the weekend. Uh, shows you that they know where the puck is and they know mm -hmm. how to spread it around and get it into the, into the net, as they say. So very exciting what's going on in uh, hockey. Beautiful new mullet arena uh, in our second year in there, and it has made a difference all the way around, including oh, no recruiting, uh, and the experience there, uh, as reflected by the fans, uh, is nothing but superior. So really proud of Greg, really proud of this team, really proud of uh, Mullet Arena, uh, and looking forward to just many years of great hockey here, Tim. Hockey hits the road for the first time this season. This coming weekend, the Ice Devils heading to Oxford, Ohio, just a little bit uh, northwest of Cincinnati, for two games against the Red Hawks of Miami of Ohio. The puck will drop at 4.05 p.m. Arizona time this coming Friday and Saturday, October 27th and 28th. And good news from the Mountain America Credit Union Sun Devil Radio Network. We'll have both games of the Miami series this weekend on the radio for you, as you can uh, hear the call on Fox Sports Radio 910 a.m., as well as on the iHeart Radio app with the voice of Sun Devil Hockey, Tyler Paley, on the play-by-play. -play calling the game alongside of Ale uh, analyst Alex Coyle. So be sure to join them, 4.05 p.m. The puck drops Friday and Saturday, ASU at Miami of Ohio. Let's talk some soccer now. A pair of one nothing nail biters last weekend for the Sun Devil soccer team in their final two home games of the 2023 season. Last Thursday night, the 24th ranked Sun Devils edged Number 11, USC, one to nothing, with goalie Pauline Nellis setting a new Arizona State single-season record with her ninth shutout victory of the year. Then on Sunday, despite Pauline's career-high nine saves, one of them coming on a penalty shot, the Sun Devils fell in a one nothing game, losing to a great opponent, the number two-ranked UCLA Bruins. That game also at Sun Devil Soccer Stadium. Soccer's now 10-3-4 on the season. They are 5-2-1 in Pac-12 games with an RPI ranking of 22. And Coach Graham Winkworth's team in great position, Ray, to make it to postseason. Oh, it looks like they're on the way to postseason uh, <coughs> for a second year in a row. And, uh, you know, Coach Winkworth has got a really, really fine squad and young, uh, to be sure. Uh, but certainly Pauline in as our goalie with her nine shutouts and, you know, I was at the game on uh, against UCLA when she 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 took down a penalty kick, and that's yeah. like almost uh, impossible to do. Tough but to do. she's got such instincts and a really fine fine soccer player. So we beat USC number eleven. Uh, we get nipped at the very end, by the way, by number two UCLA one to zero. So this team is ranked number twenty two, deservedly so. 
uh, and a postseason berth uh, is absolutely within reach. Uh, and we're looking forward to a strong finish. And speaking of Pauline Nellis, uh, she happened to be named the Pac-12 Goalkeeper of the Week this week, the second time this year she has won that award. The Sun Devils begin their final stretch of the season this weekend as they travel to the Pac-12 Mountain Schools. They'll be at Utah this Thursday for a 5 p.m. Uh, game time and then at Colorado on Sunday, and that match will start at 11 a.m. It has been a terrific season for the Sun Devil volleyball team thus far in 2023. And coming up, we will visit with two members of Coach J.J. Van Neal's ASU volleyball program. Middle blocker Maddie McLaughlin will join us to discuss her inspirational battle with Lyme disease and how she has overcome that to become such a solid member of the Sun Devil volleyball team. And then up next, you will meet ASU's top assistant coach, a one-time volleyball star at Hamilton High School and the daughter of a former Sun Devil wrestling great. Coach Presley Anderson will drop by and visit with us in just a moment. This is the Anderson Healy Show from the Mountain America Credit Union Sun Devil Radio Network. Now, this time out. We're back on the Anderson Healy Show from the Mountain America Credit Union Sun Devil Radio Network. I'm Tim Healy, the radio voice of the Sun Devils, working alongside of Arizona State Athletic Director Ray Anderson. Ray and I are glad you're here with us. When former USC assistant J.J. Van Neal was hired late last year to become the new head coach of the Sun Devil women's volleyball program, one of the first people that Coach Van Neal called upon taking the job is the woman that you are about to meet a one-time volleyball star at Chandler's Hamilton High School and a star for two different sets of Bears at the collegiate level, the Cal Bears and the Baylor Bears. Presley Anderson was a volunteer assistant coach at TCU last season, and she helped guide the Horned Frogs into the NCAA tournament. Now she's back here in her hometown as the lead assistant coach for the resurgent Sun Devil women's volleyball program, and she is our guest today on the Anderson Healy Show. Presley, great to have you on the show. Great to have you back in your hometown. How does it feel? Yeah, I mean, it's great. This is, I, I, every time this gets brought up, like, wow, I'm back home, you know, first time assistant lands their job where I would want it most, you know, near my friends and family. I couldn't have asked for a better first start for, for this kind of gig. Yeah, for sure. What was your first reaction when uh, Coach Van Neal got a hold of you? I honestly, I can't lie, I ended up accepting the job or telling him yes before I even asked what the salary was <laughs> because I was so excited. Um, you know, I had initially reached out to him because um, my mutual friend is Brad Keller, the head coach at USC, and so he informed me, let me know that JJ got the head coaching job. Um, you know, Brad was trying to help me find a place, and he's like, you got to text JJ, congratulate him on getting the job, and just see if you can get in there. And so I, you know, reached out to JJ, and luckily enough, um, after six or seven conversations, he ended up offering me, and it's just, it's, I'm just really lucky to honestly be here. And the fact is that the job came, and what we said is Presley's hometown. In fact, uh, a lot of our Longtime Sun Devil sports fans might remember her dad, Mike Anderson, was an outstanding wrestler at Arizona State in the late 80s and early 90s and was a teammate of current Sun Devil wrestling coach Zeke Jones. Yep, yep. So it's, it's been in my blood, that maroon and gold. I swear I've been to more ASU wrestling matches than volleyball matches <laughs> in my time. I'll yeah. bet you. I'll bet your dad is thrilled that you're here, huh? Yeah, his reaction, like I can still see it in my head of, me telling him he was out in his garage playing his guitar. I went out there. I'm like, Dad, I just got offered the ASU assistant job. And, I mean, he's wanted me to be a Sun Devil, you know. He, was, he wanted me to play here. Um, it's, it was a big part of my recruiting process was Arizona State. And me not coming here, you know, he was still proud of me, of course. Sure, sure. Um, but to finally get me in maroon and gold is something he's been waiting a long time for. So, yeah, he was really proud. As we mentioned, you were an outstanding player at uh, Hamilton High School. Did Arizona State recruit you out of high? How did you end up at California? Yeah, um, Arizona State did recruit me, actually. They were one of the schools that was in the mix for a very long time. You know, I always grew up going to the games. Obviously, like, I was a Sun Devil fan since I came out the womb, it feels like. But um, ultimately, I am a very independent person. I felt like it was best for me to go somewhere outside of the state. And so, you know, Cal offers a pretty good degree. Um, and I really wanted to stay in the Pac-12 because that's what I grew up knowing and loving. And mm -hmm. so... 
Um, you know, I was really kind of aiming at those four Pac-12 schools in California, um, just because distance-wise it made the most sense. And so I ended up going to Cal because I just fell in love with the campus and the coaching staff at that time, um, who I actually didn't even end up playing for. I never really had the same head coach two years in a row wow. because of various different reasons, COVID being one of them mm -hmm. and the transfer. But um, <laughs> I think that's really allowed me, given me the opportunity to adapt with so many different coaching styles, you know, it's really helped me come into my own as an assistant coach and be so confident in kind of who I am as a younger coach. Well, now you're one of the uh, lead, the lead assistant coach uh, for JJ Van Neal on a team that's just turned in a remarkable season so far. You're ranked 21st in the nation, a spectacular 19 and three record. From your seat, Presley, as you observe this, what, in your opinion, has been the are the main reasons for this incredible turnaround? Yeah, I think, I mean, if you would have asked me, you know, even the day after I took my job, I knew what I was getting into. You know, we had nine girls on the team when me and JJ got here initially, um, had to get a few from the transfer portal, a few late addition freshmen, um, and really try and instill a really strong culture fast, which is hard to do. Um, because there's just a lot of newness and, and girls I've, I've known, you know, being in that position where I've had a new staff come in and try and teach something like it can take time, months to develop the relationships that it needs to get us in this position. And I think that's exactly what JJ um, is great at. And from the top down, he makes sure that he's connecting with and are communicating with every person in our program and letting them know like one immediately off the bat that he wants to spend time with them outside of the gym so they get to know him mm -hmm. they get to know our staff and that's really where that trust kicks in and that's why you know I really do think um, if it wasn't for our culture we probably wouldn't be in this space but because JJ made it a priority right when he got here we're able to you know sit here at 19 and 3 of course still hungry for our, the second half of pack but right. um, certainly can give ourselves a little bit of pat on the back for just the turnaround in general. It, it helps, doesn't it, when you take over a team? You said mm -hmm. nine girls, and a lot of them are solid veteran players like uh, Marta Levinska, Shannon Shields, Jelly Sear, yeah. Roberta Rabello, and the young lady that we're going to visit with in the next segment, Maddie McLaughlin, to have yep. that kind of... How was the buy-in? The buy-in had to have come really quickly from that group. Yeah, totally. I think they were also just eager to see, you know, what they could do. I know a lot of them have like, one year, two years left, um, and once we kind of laid the foundation of like, we are going to give you guys all the resources, all of our time, all of our energy as a staff. Now, can you try and meet us? And I think they've done a fantastic job of absolutely meeting us where we're at. You know, I think, um, they kind of surprised themselves with the talent in the gym and what confidence can really do to a group. And, mm -hmm. Um, you know, really trying to call these girls up to their potential and just continue trying to grow, especially um, over such a short period of time. It's really hard to do, but it's, it's easy when you have good leaders at the top. Um, so it's player led and it's not us continuously directing and orchestrating this, but it's like they feel like they have their hands in it and a piece in the culture. All through the years I've broadcast ASU sports in all three, football, basketball, baseball, some of the best teams always are. It seems like the best teams at any school in any sport are player led. Totally, you know, when, when, totally. When, when your players are leading your other players, that's when you have the best success. A big weekend coming up. You uh, have rematches against uh, the Bay Area yeah. teams, including uh, your former school. You got the uh, Cal coming here on Friday, 6 p.m. at Desert Financial Arena, and then Sunday over at the Mullet, a noon match against number three ranked Stanford. Now, you've already seen those two teams losing at Stanford, winning at California. Your thoughts yep. on the rematches coming up? Yeah, I'm excited. You know, second half of conference, it's like a brand new start. Like, I like to think everyone's zero and zero because now, and except now it's going to be even harder because they've had a chance to play us and know kind of how we're going to defend them, how we're going to kind of attack them offensively, and then vice versa. So you kind of have to level up your game a little bit this next go around because they have more intel on you, you know, more information and scouting and whatnot. Um, but for us, I'm, I'm actually really excited. I thought we handled um, our tougher matches pretty well the first half. And so now it's like, can we have that second surge of like 
you know, we're, we're refreshed, we're hungry, we want to get them, like, once isn't enough, we want to get them a second time. Or in Stanford's case, you know, why not us? Why not this group now? It's the perfect setting at Mullet Arena. Um, you know, I know that's a popular game for fans to come to, so I'm excited to see that, that just the energy. Um, and if anything, at the end of the day, at the end of the match, both matches, you know, we just want to feel good, like we're heading in the right direction as we um, hopefully gear up for postseason. And how far can that right direction take you? Yeah, can I mean, you be playing deep into December? We, we could absolutely be playing deep in December. You know, I like you mentioned, I was at TCU and I got to be a part of a really cool turnaround there. You know, they were bottom of the Big 12 the year before I got there. And then last year, you know, um, because of similar reasons, culture being one of them and just the values, like I was able to see a team who was, you know, last in the conference go into the tournament and honestly just play all out. And that's all I'm going to ask. That's all we're going to ask of our girls. Um, it's going to be a new experience. There's going to be some big eyes. But at the end of the day, everyone starts again zero and zero in postseason. And that's what kind of makes it so exciting. It is going to be exciting down the stretch. Well, Presley, it's great to have you back home. It's great yeah, to have you here you. at Arizona State. Best of luck in your coaching career and best of luck to you and the team the rest of this season. Thanks so much. That's Thanks for having me. Presley Anderson, Sun Devil assistant volleyball coach, our guest on this segment of the Anderson Healy Show. Coming up next, you'll meet the, uh, a young lady who's authored one of the most inspiring stories on this year's ASU volleyball team as middle blocker Maddie McLaughlin will stop by for a visit. But first, let's take a break. This is the Anderson Healy Show from the Mountain America Credit Union Sun Devil Radio Network. Maddie McLaughlin has been an example of perseverance and tenacity for her Sun Devil teammates, having overcome a serious illness that ravaged her for several years during her high school days to reach a point now where she's one of the key performers on an Arizona State volleyball team enjoying its best season in a decade. Maddie McLaughlin is our guest this week here on the Anderson Healy Show. And before we welcome her in, more pertinent today, we say happy birthday, Maddie. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. That's awesome. <laughs> Dare I say 24 years oh, old today? Oh, gosh. That's what they tell me. It's yeah. out there. Yeah. Well, it's out there now. <laughs> hey, it's great to see you. How exciting has this season been for oh, you and your gosh. teammates? What a yeah. turnaround. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right. And and it's, you know, it's tempting to say, oh, it's surprising because, you know, we struggled for a few years there. But mm -hmm. at the same point, you know, I think we have worked so hard and we've put in a ton of effort um, in the off season and, you know, adapting to the new coaching staff that, mm -hmm. to me, it kind of makes sense. You know, really? it, it, yeah. Yeah. That's great to hear. We're going to yeah. talk uh, about this year's team a little bit later on in the uh, segment, but I want to take you back now to your high school days. Maddie is from the Buffalo area, East Aurora, New York, just outside of Buffalo. You're growing up there. You always loved sports. Basketball mm -hmm. was the first sport you played until I read the story where it was actually your basketball coach that suggested you take up volleyball. Yeah, yeah, something like that. It, um, I, yeah, I was in eighth grade at the time, and there they had just started like a, a volleyball club team, sort of. You know, it mm -hmm. wasn't super serious at that point, but yeah. Um, yeah, they suggested that I give it a shot, and I thought it was kind of a joke of a sport. And I was like, you know, I'm <laughs> going to play basketball. You know, that'll be my future. Yeah, yeah. Um, no need to take this seriously. But then. Um, yeah. You were good at it. Huh? I, well, <laughs> at first, you know, I don't think anybody's ever good at volleyball when they first start. It's just, it's like tennis, you know, mm -hmm. it's just kind of frustrating until you get to a certain competence, I yep. think, and then yep. it becomes really enjoyable. Um, I imagine golf's like that, yes, too. Yes, I think you're right. So. I think you're right. Um, but yeah, so then going into high school is when I kind of, I actually started to take it seriously, um, and I tried out for the team there. So, so you're in volleyball now. Now it's mm -hmm. nearing the end of your freshman year, yes. and at this point, your health starts to become a big right. issue. Tell us about yeah. that period of your life. What exactly mm -hmm. happened? What kind of symptoms were you feeling? And what was the diagnosis? Yeah, so at that point, um, I just concluded my freshman season of volleyball and was heading into basketball. Um, and I actually, there I think there was like whooping cough. There was pertussis going around my team. And so I started, I, I caught that. But then it was like, I just never got better. And so mm -hmm. I started actually developing more symptoms. Um, and the biggest one of those being the just the crushing fatigue. Um, and so I had to withdraw from, ba from basketball. And then it got to the point where I had to withdraw from school. Wow. Too. Um, yeah, and, and the school would say... This is at send, the end of your freshman year? Or? No, this is way before that. It was. Oh. It took about... I mean, the, the decline happened for maybe a month or two. And so um, by that December, I was completely out oh of school. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and the yeah. diagnosis eventually was Lyme, Lyme disease. disease. Yeah, it took about two years to get to that diagnosis, though. We, that's, you know, Lyme disease is known as the great imitator um, because it has such a wide variety of symptoms mm -hmm. that are possible, and so it's really hard to diagnose. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it took, it took two years for us to kind of figure it out. Well, Lyme disease, from what I've been able to research, is a disease caused by bacteria, bacteria that are transmitted by ticks. And if one lives in grassy, wooded, or brushy areas, primarily in the upper Midwest, mid-Atlantic states, or the northeastern United States, you are at risk of contracting this disorder. And have I basically described East Aurora, that. New York, outside of Buffalo? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yeah. And also coming from um, Connecticut to. Oh, you spent some very, time in yes, Connecticut. Yeah. yeah. So very similar. Um, you know, same same issues there. I mean, I grew up in the East Coast and, as well, in yeah. Virginia, and have you know relatives in Pennsylvania, and that's yeah, that's that's mm -hmm. that geography of that whole completely. region. Completely. Oh yeah, completely. Yep. So it starts sometimes as a rash, but like you said, mm -hmm. there's just a variety of different symptoms. Yes. Yes. Exactly. And and for me, um, this is actually my second time. So the first time I I got Lyme when I was much younger, um, and I had the rash right away. Very easy to diagnose. We we got it within the first um, two weeks, which mm -hmm. is kind of the you know the acute phase. So if you get it, then you hit it with you know the carpet bomb of antibiotics, mm -hmm. and you're pretty much good to go, which I was at that point. Um, but yeah, this time it was so much harder to recognize, and so because of that, it had slipped into the chronic phase, and it was much harder to treat then. So how how long were you out of school then? Um, so I was out for that freshman year, all of my sophomore year. Um, wow. But yeah, by my junior year, I worked with the school administrators to, to make a condensed schedule because it was really hard for me to walk around. Did for... you do any homeschooling? Yes. This oh, sophomore? that whole time. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I had tutors come. Oh, okay. um, yeah. So by my junior year, I was able to walk enough that I could make it to, they kind of condensed my schedule and kept the classes really close together and worked with me. Um, so I would go in for a few hours, just get all of my classes done, right. and then go home and just, I would lie in bed for the remainder of the day and kind wow. of recover from that. What, yeah. was, what was that period of time like for you? We were talking before uh, we started taping this segment, and we'll mention at the end, but Maddie's a psychology major, and you're mm -hmm. about to get your degree in December, yes. which is fantastic. But in the realm of sports psychology is becoming big, but what was your life like from a psychological standpoint yeah. during that time, dealing yeah. with that adversity mm -hmm. and not being able to play a sport mm -hmm. you really enjoy? It's a great question. Yeah, I think that became the biggest hurdle at a certain point there. You know, for a while it was just sort of racing to figure out what was going on. And, you know, I, I at, at the point of, you know, when I first started developing symptoms, I never could have imagined that I would have been out for the next three years. Yeah. And so as that time progressed, um, it became harder and harder to to believe that I could return to to sports, and and also if I could return, you know, I was terrified that I wouldn't be the athlete that I once was. That maybe things would be irreparably damaged, mm -hmm. or you know, I um, I had a lot of of anxiety and fear about that, um, and also just the time element. You know, I think especially in today's world specialization is pushed on athletes at a really young age. Yes, um, and I you know I believe ultimately to their detriment. Um, and so for me, I kind of got caught up in that pressure, that time pressure. And I knew, you know, by the time I got back as a senior, nobody knew who I was. There was no recruiting going on. There was, you know, there, that, that time had passed. Um, and so there was a lot of mental struggles that I had to deal with during that time. Um, yeah, I would say that that became probably, you know, the, the one of the bigger hurdles mm -hmm. along the way. Yeah. But your health started getting better. You mm -hmm. probably at that point saw the light at the end of the tunnel. Right. How did you get back on the, for lack of a better term, on the volleyball circuit or yeah, in, uh, right, right. making yourself visible <laughs> yeah. at a time when most athletes of your mm -hmm. age are being recruited and mm -hmm. starting to look at colleges? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I So I actually never really got recruited. It was more a matter of my, you know, putting myself out there. Um, and I come from a very small town where most people, you know, they might play D3, but very few athletes go on. Um, and so, yeah, I, I reached out to the, the high school coach and I said, look, you know, I'm, I'm coming back. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm working as hard as I can to get in shape and mm -hmm. to, you know, sort of work my way back in. Um, and so then I, you know, I, I worked with her over that one season that I had. Right. And then I just sent out a battery of emails mm -hmm. to Division three schools. Um, most of them turned me down, and but I, I managed to get the attention of one who said that they would be happy to have me. 
And um, that school was? SUNY Geneseo in yep. upstate New York. SUNY yeah. being State University of New York. Yeah, I grew up on the East Coast. But uh, <laughs> uh, So you get there and you play one year and uh, you did really well there, mm -hmm. as I understand it. Yeah, my first year, um, yeah, I was named the, the SUNYAC um, Rookie of the Year. Mm -hmm. And then that next season, so my sophomore season, I started to feel like I wanted a little bit more and that maybe, you know, my, my dream had always been to play professionally. Um, and I felt like being at that level was not going to be able to prepare me for, mm -hmm. for what I ultimately wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so how did Arizona State enter the picture? Oh, uh, yeah, so. The girl from Buffalo ends right. up in the desert, huh? <laughs> Yeah, so I did the same thing that I did um, as a senior in high school. So I sent out the next round of 50 emails um, and actually my, my older brother was instrumental in that process because there was a lot of self-doubt at that point. Mm -hmm. I talked to a recruiting expert who told me I had no chance at playing Division One, and said I should aim maybe higher D3, you know, I might get a chance there, but, you know, nobody would want me at the Division One level. Um, and my brother, you know, he just, he would remind me almost on a daily basis that self-doubt kills more dreams than talent alone ever will. And that actually was really, really helpful for me. And so I felt like, you know what? Okay, I'm just, I'm going to go now for I it, basically. I see why you got into psychology <laughs> yeah, as a major, right. huh? Right, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We prevent ourselves from doing so much oh, that yeah. we are capable of, yeah. Um, My football broadcast partner, Jeff Van Raphorst, has said for years, if you could figure out a way to bottle and sell confidence, you could make millions. There you go. That's perfect. That's exactly yep. it. Yes. And he's spot on. Oh, correct. my gosh. Yep. Yes, we are our own worst critics. And, and that, and and that applies to people in every walk of life, mm -hmm. not just athletes. Oh, God, yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I, I sent out another 50 emails, and Arizona State was one of the schools that said, hey, you know, we're interested in you. We'd love to have you come out for a visit. I had no idea that I would end up out here. You know, I, I had heard all of the stories about ASU, like, oh, the big party school, whatever. You know, I just... Yep. Um, what time of year did you come out here first? Oh, when was I think it was um, December around there. I mean, it was beautiful. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't so you did it the wrong degrees. way, Maddie. My, my first job interview out here for uh -huh. a TV job was in June. So I came out here and got the full Monty of how hot it can be. Uh -huh, so yeah. I knew right away. You right. Know, when you come out in December, you're saying, oh, this is oh, great. Oh, this is it, yeah. Then welcome uh -huh. to July. Yes, you know? I know. Oh, yeah, that was a rude awakening. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, it, I just completely fell in love with the feeling of being on the West Coast. And, um, and just the landscape, even as basic as that sounds, I'd never been around mountains like that. And to be able to just kind of look out and, and see the sun setting over the mountains, that just... Mm -hmm. that, that sold it for me. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, now, so we're going to fast forward a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now we're into your volleyball career. Yeah. Four years later, here you are, a second year graduate student on a mm -hmm. team that is coached by J.J. Van Neel. He was a USC assistant. He got the job at the very end of last year. What was your yeah. first reaction when you heard the news? And what's your overview of this phenomenal season that your team is enjoying right now? Yeah, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, when I heard about JJ, I was very excited. Um, and he he was fantastic about reaching out to all the, the nine of us, I guess, the returning players. Mm -hmm. um, and he made us feel very welcomed and valued and appreciated. Um, and that our voices were heard, which was very important. Um, so very excited about him and then yeah I mean this season like I said before you know it has felt like it's the culmination of a lot of hard work um, and and also I think we realized that the expectations were pretty low you mm -hmm. know for most first-year head coaches I think that's kind of how it goes right um, and so we felt like we wanted to sort of disrupt that narrative a little bit mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. and so we just you've we blown that, away that yeah. <laughs> narrative I think is what you've done I yeah I suppose so um, but yeah so it's just been a lot of hard work and a lot of culture building it seems like though it does help when you have a solid group of veterans mm -hmm. like yourself mm -hmm. and like Marta Levinska and yes. Shannon Shields and Jelly mm -hmm. Sear those kind of players yeah the buy-in must have come pretty quickly absolutely and, and I think because you know we have all worked together before um, and we overcame a lot of difficulties in the past together. I think that, you know, forming a cohesive unit was a lot easier than for, I guess, most teams when it's just kind of transfers and freshmen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about you because you made a position switch, as I understand it, this year, moving yes. from outside hitter to middle blocker, which mm -hmm. is a difficult position to learn <laughs> how to play, so mm -hmm. much so that... My spies tell me that you had to come in and do a whole bunch of work on your own just oh, to yeah. uh, get up to speed. What oh, yeah. what led you to agree to the position change, and what have been the biggest adjustments for you? In yeah, that? yeah, yeah. 
Um, so I think I think I recognize pretty quickly that um, my my particular talents on the volleyball court just lended themselves better to being a middle blocker. And in the past, for my past few years here, you know, my former coach and some teammates would tell me that you know my first coach did me a disservice by not making me a middle, but that it was too late at that point to switch, which is pretty ironic mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. at this point. But yeah, so I think I, I was able to recognize that, and then I just threw myself into it completely. Um, and I watched, you know, I committed to watching almost 50,000 clips of setters just to learn how to, how to read setters. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of the hardest skills as a middle is just kind of that lateral movement and yeah, just, yeah. just trying to anticipate and then read, read the opponent's offense. Well, clearly the switch has gone well because you've been a key contributor on a team that's just off to a phenomenal start. Mm -hmm. Do you sense the inspiration that you've been to your teammates because of the journey you've had, the health issues you've overcome, the position switch you made for the good of the team, all of that? Yeah, um, I, I don't know. You know, somebody asked me that question um, a couple weeks ago and it actually, it really, like I sat with it for a while because it's something I don't, I don't think about very often, mm -hmm. um, but I hope that I have had some sort of um, influence on them. And, and also to, I think anybody, like you said, that is lacking confidence, you know, whether they're yeah. an athlete or not. I right. think it's something that we all struggle with, um, especially no in a world when there's so much content and so much, you know, feels like evidence of other people leading more glamorous or more successful lives than your own. Um, and so, yeah, I, I hope that, you know, I can sort of be living proof that if you love something enough and you work hard enough at it and you just fully commit yourself to it, literally anything is possible. Is a national championship possible. How far can this team go? You're 19 and three, yeah, yeah. you're seven and three in Pac-12 play. You had mm -hmm. a bit of a glitch over the weekend yes, on the we back end yes. at Colorado after mm -hmm. a great match at right. uh, Utah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on this team? Uh, yeah. Get that crystal ball work. Okay. Where are we headed? <laughs> um, I think if we're able to develop the mindset of a ranked team, because I think in the past we were that that team with a ton of potential that kind of flew under the radar. Mm -hmm. And now as a ranked team, we're on everybody's radar. Right. And so I think just understanding that every match is going to be a dogfight is really important for us. Um, and just, you know, as, as our, our head coach JJ says, just keeping the foot on the gas and playing like it's championship point every single time we touch the ball um, is going to be really important for us. And I think if we do that, yeah, I think we can make a deep run. Are you a sentimental sort, winding down your college career? Mm -hmm. You're graduating in December, your degree mm -hmm. in psychology. Congrats on that. Uh, tell us how you want to employ that degree. Uh, yes, yeah, so I would love to work with athletes um, in the future. I mean, I, I want to play as long as I possibly can just because I feel like I got to it so late. Um, I mean, I, you know, I just turned 24 today, but I feel like in terms of volleyball years, I'm like 17 or something. <laughs> well, um, good for you. You should, I think. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Um, but yeah, I would love to then kind of pass on what I feel like I've learned because of my unique path through volleyball mm -hmm. um, to future generations of athletes in some gonna, way. Going to be hard to say goodbye to Tempe in Arizona yeah. State? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Especially after this season that we've had and this really special group of girls that we have. It's, it's definitely going to be hard. Well, yours is a remarkable story, young lady, thank and you. a tremendous story. We thank you for sharing it with us today. Continued success to you and the team this season. Let's hope you're playing you. well into the month of December. Yeah. And last but not least, again, happy birthday. <laughs> thank you, Tim. Thanks. So great to visit with Sun Devil volleyball player Maddie McLaughlin on this segment of the Anderson Healy Show. Ray will rejoin me for the final segment of today's show in a moment. This is the Anderson Healy Show from the Mountain America Credit Union Sun Devil Radio Network. We welcome you back as we approach the finish line of this week's installment of the Anderson Healy Show from the Mountain America Credit Union Sun Devil Radio Network. I'm the Healy part of the show, Tim Healy, the radio voice of the Sun Devils. Now to the Anderson part of the show as Ray Anderson rejoins me right now. And guess what? We're going to talk some hoops. We're just two weeks away, two weeks away from the start of the college basketball season. And in this period of time in late October, a lot of college programs line up preseason exhibition games against other Division I opponents. Now, these are games that are played without any advanced publicity, without any fans in attendance. If you're a fan of the movie Animal House, you'd probably consider them double secret probation type games. But they are still welcome preseason dress rehearsals for the teams and their players and coaches. And Coach Bobby Hurley's Sun Devils had their exhibition game this past weekend against none other 
than last year's national runners-up, the San Diego State Aztecs, who lost to Coach Hurley's brother, Danny Hurley, and the Yukon Huskies in the national championship game at the Final Four. And how about this? The Hurley family continues to have the hex over the Aztecs <laughs> as Bobby Hurley's Sun Devils won that exhibition game 72-68 over San Diego State. The game was played in an empty Viejas Arena on the San Diego State campus. Uh, the bad news is the Devils nearly squandered a 20-point lead. They were up 40 to 20 at the half. The good news is they won by four, 72-68, as uh, ASU got terrific performances from Louisville transfer Kamari Lands, who finished with 18 points to lead the Devils. And uh, Arizona State's two returning backcourt stars, Frankie Collins, and Jemiah Neal each chipped in. Frankie with 15 points, Ray, and Jemiah had 14. Bobby Hurley told me uh, a week or so ago that he thinks Kamari Lands is going to be one of his top three scorers, maybe even better than that, based on that one performance against San Diego State. Well, it certainly looks like it. That's a great start against a great uh, uh, team, no doubt. And Ken Lanfear, who is our senior admin for uh, basketball, uh, you know, told me when I came in, hey, man. This team played very well. You don't want to get too far in front of ourselves, but mm -hmm. it looks like we've put together a very strong squad uh, with Kamari and Jose Perez, who I think you're going to talk about, right. along with our returners, uh, really melding, uh, meshing very well already. Mm -hmm. So uh, very enthusiastic. You don't want to oversell it because right, it was right. an, uh, an exhibition. Uh, but he was very pleased with what he saw. Uh, and it sounds like you are too, Tim. Yeah, another guy that I'd throw in there from uh, that I saw in the box score had some good numbers. The big seven-foot center from LSU, Sean Phillips. I think he had eight points, three rebounds, a couple of block shots, yeah. and he can be a difference maker in the paint. Oh, and you need that size in the paint, and we've needed it. So it looks like we may have a solution there. Keep him healthy uh, and keep him uh, improving. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a shot. So I think what you're seeing is a, a roster that – uh, will intrigue people, so they'll want to make sure they get their tickets and, uh, and plan to come out and watch some uh, men's hoops here at ASU. Boy, please do get your tickets. It's going to be a fun season of hoops at uh, Desert Financial. Also, some encouraging news that Ray referenced, Coach Hurley able to make one big last-minute addition to his 2023-2024 roster as guard Jose Perez signed with ASU last week to complete his transfer from uh, West Virginia, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, West Virginia is a school at which Perez never ended up playing. He had to sit out last year in Morgantown after the NCAA denied his waiver as a uh, two -time, uh, for a, uh, to play as a two-time transfer. Now, two years ago when he did last play at Manhattan in New York, Jose Perez was a first-team All-Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference pick when he averaged 19 points and nearly five assists per game. He has gotten his degree now, Ray, as a graduate transfer. He is eligible to play right away at Arizona State. Yes, and we're very pleased with that. And, uh, you know, when you're dealing with transfers and waivers, uh, it's a little tricky these days, to be sure. Yeah. Uh, but we were able to accomplish it uh, with Jose. We give our compliance uh, and our academic uh, folks a lot of the credit for making sure that was done process-wise correct. So he's here. We're delighted to have him here. I'm, I'm really personally excited to go out and see him practice and play, but I understand he's going to be a really, really valuable addition to this squad. He can score the ball, as they say, with a 19 points per game average at a very good basketball school in Manhattan. Now, signing Jose Perez gives Coach Hurley some backcourt insurance, if you will, if LSU transfer Adam Miller's bid for a waiver to play this season as a two-time transfer is denied by the NCAA. Ray, is there any update on the situation with Adam? I'm not apprised of any uh, update uh, uh, with Adam yet. We just have our fingers crossed, and, you know, it's uh, it's just a waiting game sometime mm -hmm. with the uh, the governance yes. uh, in the NCAA, and so we're no different. We're waiting. Sun Devil Hoops will open its 2023-2024 season in two weeks on Wednesday, November 8th. And a very attractive matchup it will be in Chicago against the Mississippi State Bulldogs from the Southeastern Conference. It's a game that will be played as part of the 2023 Barstool Sports Invitational, part of a doubleheader at Trust Arena in Chicago with Final Four team Florida Atlantic playing the Ramblers of Loyola of Chicago in the other game of that doubleheader. 
Let's talk some swimming now. The number one ranked Sun Devil men's swimming team was victorious last Friday, defeating North Carolina State at the Mona Plummer Aquatic Center 186.5 to 113.5. The number 21 Sun Devil women fell to the fourth ranked Wolfpack as they lost 169.5 to 130.5. Among the individual stars, Arizona State's incomparable Leon Marchand winning all four events in which he competed, the, four, uh, the 500 free, the 400 free relay, the 100 breast, and the 200 medley relay. While in the women's competition, Sun Devil Denise Ertan won the 1,000 freestyle in a time of 9 minutes, 36.66 seconds, making that, Ray, the fourth fastest time in the 1,000 freestyle in Arizona State history. Uh, Leon, Denise, and so many other of our student athletes are uh, performing at all-time levels here. Uh, so Coach Bowman, to be sure, uh, knows how to put the team together, knows how to recruit them, and then most importantly, knows how to train and develop. So uh, we're number one ranked on the men's side for mm -hmm. good reason, uh, number 21 ranked on the women's side for good reason. Uh, the women are getting better and better trying to uh, move it up. Mm -hmm. uh, the men are going to get better and better to try to maintain it uh, and retain it for the long term. So uh, the swimming program is exciting. Again, uh, Mona Plummer, a beautiful facility to come out. People ought to come out and watch our men and women swim and dive. It's an exciting program with nothing but upside. And you'll have a chance to do that next Saturday, November 4th, 11 a.m., dare I say, perhaps the last ever Pac-12 swim meet with the USC Trojans. ASU and USC will be in the pool at the Moner, uh, Moner, Mona Plummer <laughs> Aquatic Center at 11 a.m. on Saturday, November 4th. So uh, you can bring your radios, put you in your earplugs, listen to our broadcast of the Sun Devil Utah football game that'll be kicking off that time and watch some great college swimming, ASU <laughs> and USC. Sun Devil Women's Golf closed out its fall competition schedule last weekend with a seventh place finish at the Stanford Intercollegiate event in Stanford, California. The Sun Devils finished their three rounds at nine over par, finishing seventh in a 19-team field. Individually, Ashley Many, who has been one of the stars for Coach Missy Farquay's team in the fall season, shot a one over par 214 over three rounds to tie for 22nd place. She was the Sun Devils' top individual finisher, while Patience Rhodes shot an outstanding final round of 69 to move 13 spots up, or excuse me, 15 spots up on the leaderboard in the final day of competition and move into the top 30 finishers in the event. So all in all, a pretty solid fall for Missy's team. Oh, very, very much so. And that Stanford Invitational, you know, the 19 teams there, I bet uh, all of them were ranked somewhere in the top 30. Right. Uh, and so to go in and finish seventh, uh, you know, Ashley's going to play well. Great to see Patience come back and have an outstanding final day. So you put it all together, a seventh uh, place finish at the Stanford. That's a tough course, a tough feel. Uh, now we're getting ready for the spring season mm -hmm. uh, coming up, but a good fall season. Next up for Missy's team, the well-deserved two-month break. They will next compete in the match in the desert at Gold Canyon. That'll be coming up on January the 22nd. Finally this week, congratulations to former Sun Devil triathlon star and 2023 Arizona State graduate Audrey Ernst. Audrey is one of 30 nominees for the 2023 NCAA Woman of the Year Award. Audrey helped lead Arizona State to four national championships in women's triathlon during her time as a student athlete here and was a two-time All-American for Coach Cliff English's program. She graduated summa cum laude from ASU this past spring with a degree in nursing, at which time she was also named a recipient of the Bill Kajikawa Award as the top graduating female student athlete in the Arizona State class of 23. A tremendous honor for Audrey to be one of the 30 nominees for the NCAA Woman of the Year Award. Oh, Audrey is a tremendous, tremendous uh, representative and role model for all of us here at Sun Devil Athletics. Uh, Four-time uh, champion in tri, uh, summa cum laude. Uh, we're proud uh, to, to say she's now a practicing nurse at the Mayo Clinic and Hospital here. Wow. One of the top uh, places you can land as mm -hmm. a nurse uh, and well-deserved. Just a brilliant, brilliant person overall, but a student athlete supreme. 
uh, Audrey, uh, Audrey Ernst is well deserving of this, and we've got our fingers crossed that uh, she'll get the call as the uh, woman of the year. Wouldn't that be something? Be what, great. A, what a great note on which to drop the curtain on this week's installment of the Anderson Healy Show. Some thanks before we leave to our executive producer, ASU Senior Associate Athletic Director, Doug Tamaro. Thanks to our terrific engineer, Sean Crespin of the Sun Devil Radio Network for his help. And thanks as well to our wonderful show scheduler, Kim Nelson from Sun Devil Athletics. We'll be back next week with another edition of the Anderson Healy Show and we hope you'll make plans to join us. Ray, always good to visit with you and uh, looking forward to homecoming this weekend. The homecoming should be fun. Always a pleasure to visit with you, Tim, and go Devils. Go Devils. Till next time, for Ray Anderson, I'm Tim Healy. Thanks for joining us on the Anderson Healy Show. So long, everybody.